Puntao Silat is an American martial lifestyle designed from prime elements of the Chinese Kuntao and Indonesian Silat arts. If you're looking for an effective martial art and exercise with a purpose, come visit us at KuntaoSilat.com. Well, let's talk about knives. Sounds good to me. Uh, I believe that the civilian weapon of choice has got to be the knife. Um, they don't let you have guns. They prosecute you heavily for guns. Uh, the, the, the laws against knives were originally pretty racist. Uh, lower class citizens carried knives and upper class citizens carried guns. They didn't tell you that 50 years later they're going to outlaw guns too. So now they expect you to meet anybody, armed as he may come, at his convenience with whatever it is that's on his mind, on his mind, barehanded. And that's foolish. You can't meet everything that comes barehanded. What if you meet two of them? So my weapon of choice is the knife. The exigencies of carrying it from one day to another really do dictate what it is that you're going to carry. My, my top of the line Besto Westo fighting knife is probably this guy right here. I designed it. I had it constructed by one of the finest blade makers in the United States. Uh, I sheathed it with the particular concept in mind for which I designed it. I think that it's a, a good basic design. The, the sorry, the curvature of the knife is based on the natural arc of stroke of my arm and so the edge follows me anywhere I want it to go. It's distal tapered which means that the thickest part is back here toward where my hands and fingers are so the knife slips easily into that choke up kind of position. You can also work it from back here but most of, the, most of the knife fighting that I conceive of doing is done in a responsive kind of mode to an attack from ambush. And so I have a tendency to choke up closely on it and, and, and try and hide behind it as a shield, try and get my bone shield out in front of me where it can, can start to protect me and present as much of the edge of the knife to the opponent as I possibly can. I work a lot from a reinforced style. Both hands on the knife. That means that they can't attack my knife as easily as they could if I only had one hand on it or if I had one of those stupid uh, weak hand holds that you ought to be doing with a sword. Uh, a knife when you fight with a knife, you're essentially fighting with your fists. A knife gives you no extension whatsoever. And so you have to adjust what it is that you're doing to the size of the knife that you're working with. The sheath for this kind of knife, this has a, a, a piece of spring steel reinforcement in it so it carries it up close to the body and so the sheath doesn't flex much as the knife goes in and out of it. It has a point pad up at the top. I carry it close enough to me that I want something for the point to hit before it, it slips back into the sheath. Got a little drainage hole so if I drop stuff down inside it I can get it back out and I can continue to use my sheath. It's uh, hand sewn so that uh, even with wear the stitching won't give up. The, the knife is not going to come out of it. Uh, it's made from about eight to nine ounce cowhide and then lined with a glove pigskin to separate it from the, the metal parts and so forth. This is a very personal knife to me. Uh, it's double wrap Damascus and the, the mountings are made out of a, a nickel and steel Damascus in a star pattern. It's got some nice jimping on it. It's a burled um, desert iron wood grip. And one of the things that you do with a knife, fighting knife, is that especially with wood you impregnate the, the 
the surface of the wood with, with beeswax, as much of it as you can get the knife to, to accept, and you buff it out with like pantyhose or something. That fills in all of the, the cracks and grain in the wood, and what happens is that the warmth of your hand starts to make the beeswax tacky, and the knife wants to stay in your hand. It, it, uh, it, it makes a non-slippery, it makes a slippery handle less slippery. As the, the beeswax cools back down then, it becomes a film that keeps the handle from scratching and showing wear and picking up a lot of oils from your hands and looking grotty. Uh, because I'm kind of proud of the wood that I choose for my knife handle, so I, I, I want to show it off a fair amount. Now, this, this is a fantasy knife, you see. This is a knife that you're probably never going to carry with you on a regular basis as self-protection. This is something that you stick in your, your belt when you have to go after somebody or when you go running out the door to get the bear or whatever it is you're, you're planning on doing with your fighting knife here. The size of knife carried all over the world is what the Indonesians call piso. This is the small utility knife. This one has much the same characteristics as this knife does. It's Damascus steel, cryogenically quenched, distally tapered, differentially tempered. Uh, uh, it has, I think this has uh, uh, a good coca bolo uh, handle on it because I like, I like good wood handles. It gives you the same kind of, of attitude of being able to choke up to the knife for that heavy leverage point that you need. Uh, the, it has a sharpened false edge because you should have as much entering wound destruction kind of stuff as you can possibly get. It's flat ground and I don't like the, the idea of uh, etching Damascus because I think that it sets up more friction in the cut. You're going to have a great deal of resistance in anything that you cut. He can be wearing canvas or ripstop nylon or leather or, or heavy kinds of clothing. He might have straps across his body. Um, he might have armored himself with some sort of uh, little Weasley armor. And so you've got to be ready to, to, to clamp down on the knife. And, and to run it through something that doesn't want to be run through. Uh, the next time you have a chance, uh, walk up to a, a quarter of beef and just stab it two or three times real good. And you'll find out the kind of, of uh, resilience and, and uh, the kind of uh, resistance that, that there is in a meat that, that you're going to go in and try and cut. There's a lot of cartilage, there's a lot of bone and stuff. and. Uh, so, so you've got to be setting down on the knife really hard. You've got to present as much edge out as you can. People that carry a knife like this, the, the old uh, uh, 1956 biker, wild one kind of carry. If you look at the squarity of my body, all of the edge is pointed out there somewhere. In order to cut my opponent, I've got to come here somewhere and make that pass right there. If I have any kind of martial arts, maybe I reverse the, the knife and come backwards like that, right? If I have the edge pointing out, anything that, that comes at me has to pass that edge, that edge and point. And, you know, if something as teeny as a kitty claw can make you uh, uh, get away from it real quick, think of what a 220-pound man with about five and a half inches of knife can do if I get real pissed. So that, that the, the, the civilian attitude toward the knife has got to be to, to accept it into your lifestyle somehow. The, the sheath for this guy, this is laminated glove pigskin and a, a linen weave and an aircraft cement that's all been face sewn across. My pit bull dog got a hold of it and chewed it up some and he couldn't do too much to it. Uh, it snaps and holds on to the knife. You can put it like that and pretty much shake it the way you want it and it's not going to come out. I didn't put a drainage hole on this one 
because most of the time I simply slip it into my belt. I don't attach it to my body at all because I want to be able to move it around with what I'm going to do. Maybe I wear a coat one time and I don't another time. But the, the idea is to simply accept your weapon into your lifestyle. The, the Japanese uh, talk about uh, living with a weapon for 30 days. You bathe with it, you eat with it, you sleep with it, you, uh, you do all of the activities of your body, of your lifetime, uh, with your weapon uh, in tow. Uh, you don't let it get more than that far away from you, this hand kind of distance. By the end of that 30 days, you're used to it. Whether it's a BAR or a pocket knife, it takes 30 days of living with it intimately for you to get ready to carry it and, and have it all the time. This little guy right here. I carry it every day of my life. I'm a saddler and harness maker by trade. I carry it every day of my life. It's my little pattern making knife. It's uh, Damascus steel, differentially tempered, cryogenically quenched, distal tapered, and I can poke hole, holes in your Mack truck with it. This is more of a fighting spike kind of idea, and the, the, the straight edge on this is the sharp edge, although it has a little entering point on the back. So that now I'm fighting with it as I would fight with my hands. I don't even consider that I have a knife in it in my hands at this point. If I present the knife, I present it in its longest attitude, holding it here backed up by the entire palm and, and forearm of my body, set it in, leave it, walk away, punch them a couple times, set the knife in, wiggle their body around to get the wound channel. You don't worry about pumping with the knife, leave the knife there. Rowdy their body around. It'll, it'll open up what it needs to open up. In terms of long knives, There you are. We've sort of got to talk about my credentials for talking about knife work and the formal sort of stuff is that I started martial art when I was nine. I'm 50, almost 51. I studied Okinawan style first, military style, some Chinese things. And then I met the Dutoir family and have been doing Pinchak Silat for 16 years with them. But that's just the formal part. That's just the historic and cultural perspective of what it is that we do. I went into the Corps and went to NAM for Mr. Kennedy and I mustered out in the penitentiary. I was five years in a maximum security penitentiary. And much of the active knife fighting that I know came from that experience. When I got out after that five calendar years, um, if I'd have been a girl, there'd have been a whore in my family. Uh, you could buy my body to go fight for you. And, um, I worked in strip joints, I worked in uh, uh, city Indian bars, uh, I did a lot of bodyguarding work for uh, jewelry people, for uh, celebrities and political people and like that, uh, rode shotgun and uh, uh, guaranteed business deals for all kinds of contraband goods. I've cut people, I've had them cut me. I've watched other people get cut, and I've watched other people cut other people. I have an appreciation of the knife from a cultural standpoint. For 15 years, I've been one of the nation's recognized knife appraisers for uh, historical and antique goods, uh, disputed provenance, probate and insurance kind of thing, expert witness work, uh, uh, I have quite a background in that. 
uh, by trade, I'm a saddle and harness maker, and I do sheaths and holsters and fitted cases, safari and expeditionary gear, that sort of thing. As far as I know, this is a real deal. I don't work from a military model. I don't have a support system. I don't have people showing up to help me come when I call them on the radio. They're not bringing up wagon loads of ammunition. They're not carting away the dead. They're not supporting me with artillery fire. I'm a civilian. I have to take care of me by myself. I make Hormat respect to the Dutoir family, to Pendekaragun Paul Dutoir, to Bapak Maguru Victor Dutoir, and most especially to the brother Willem. Thank you, sir. A lot of what you'll see, you might see also in some other practices of martial arts, Southeast Asian, Filipino, Indonesian of other styles, But this comes from the crucible, through the crucible, of having done it. I feel myself a good Christian man. And we're going to talk about some things that are very intimate, that are absolutely illegal, that are harsh on your opponent. But that's what this is all about. Let's talk about knives just a little bit. This is the pointed end, and this is the not pointed end. I, I really do prefer Damascus steel for just about anything that I do, especially in a weapon. I've had well-made factory knives snap. I've had well-made factory knives break when I dropped them on the damn concrete, and that's not conducive to living through the moment. I like Damascus steel by a good maker. I like it absolutely razor sharp. It's nothing but a heavy stick if it's not razor sharp. You want it sharp enough to stay away from it yourself. I like the idea of hand forged knives because of the distal tapering aspect of it. The thickest part of the knife back here, the most thinnest part of the knife here, gives it a balance right where that, that distal tapering starts that allows a very long knife, that's a big knife, to be very quick and, and to, not, uh, to not wear you out carrying it. Uh, you're you're going to carry it a thousand miles to cut with it an inch. So you have to think about the weight of the knife a, as you take it in in your life. I like the idea of cryogenic quenching. Uh, Sub-zero quenching in liquid nitrogen, I believe, adds to the toughness of the knife. It, it, it gives it a bell-like ring from a piece of steel. I like heavy-duty work in, in the, the mountings of the knife. These are done in Damascus steel also. And, and the grip of the knife, what we call gubu, the grip of the knife in Brazilian rosewood or something, and then it's been inlaid with a little ivory and it says Stout Defender and, and I really like it. Again, another one that I, that I designed and had constructed by a good bladesmith. This is about the upper end size for a fighting knife, anything more than this and it really does become a sword. I had it done years ago when, when I was really involved with the size of the knife, what we call golok, the cleaver. The, the idea of a big, heavy, weighted knife for fighting. Uh, now, for, for size kinds of things, I start to move to that more six and a half inch 
kind of idea and, and more of the punching model for fighting. Differential tempering. Different parts of the blade have different functions. You can see in the color change in this one that the, the edge is one uh, uh, temper. The center, the back of the blade where it uh, accepts the shock is a different temper. Where it meets into the handle is yet a softer temper so it has good flex movement. Again, distal tapered so that the, the weight of balance is in the middle of the knife. You can fight with this actually as a stick in the, in the stick model, the, the sort of Tessen model. Uh, 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 Vajra, Mushti, Congo, whatever it is that you call the nerve attack stick uh, in your particular martial art. This gives you a lot of pommel work uh, for the, the catching kinds of movements and, and, and striking with that pommel kind of attitude. Striking his weapon hand and stabbing him in the throat kind of number. Pick your knife with care. Spend money. Don't carry cheap. For the military, it's okay. You break your knife, you throw it away, you're going to be using it again, you're, they're going to give you another one fairly shortly. With us, it's my primary weapon. I don't, there is no consumable. It, I don't have another fight after this one, uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, I want it to get me through this experience, right here, right now, this experience. And for that, I don't want something that chip, fade, peel, crackle, craze, sun fade, or anything else. I want it to work first time. If I need a battlefield pickup, I'll find one on the battlefield. Other than that, I'm going to take the best equipment with me that I can afford. Stay